Five, four, three, two, one. Sir, we are live now. Okay, yeah. Good evening. Uh, welcome, everybody, to today's evening's webinar brought to you by the Orthopedic Research and Education Foundation India. Today, we have uh, an interesting session, which is going to be an interactive session on the cases of the slip capital femoral epiphysis. And the moderator is going to be Dr. Diren Ganjwala from Ahmedabad. And uh, in the panelists, we have Dr. Uh, Hitesh Shah from Manipal and Dr. Thomas Palakran from uh, uh, CMC Velour, along with myself. Uh, and uh, I hope it will be an interesting session which you, uh, everyone should enjoy. So over to you, Diren, to get the ball rolling. Yep. Good evening and uh, welcome to the session. And this is slightly a different session than other sessions. In this, we are going to have some of the technical points uh, in the form of lecture, but at the same time, the some practical points which are very important for the case uh, or the exams that we are going to have interaction. So if you have not seen the previous lecture, which I took uh, two weeks before, this is the link and uh, you can watch the session. And in that I have shown many animations by which the concept of management becomes clear. I'm going to uh, repeat the salient features or the important points uh, which we discussed on that day. The first point which we said is like a slip capital femoral epiphysis is a misnomer. The reason is it's not the epiphysis which is uh, slipping, but actually the metaphysis displaces. And this displacement is in three plane. If we are looking from the front, the metaphysis shift literally. It shifts externally when we look at, at the axial plane. And when we look at in the sagittal plane, it moves anteriorly. To make you understand this, this is what happens like uh, if we are looking in the coronal plane, the metaphysis, sorry, the metaphysis moves uh, literally. In the axial plane, if we are looking in that case, the metaphysis slips or rotate anteriorly. And when we are looking from the side or the sagittal view, the metaphysis moves anteriorly. If we talk about the classical conventional thing, in that case, the epiphysis displaces and it's in the reverse direction. It moves medially, internally and posterior. Then we are coming straightway to the management of slip capital femoral epiphysis. And there are five factors which are very important for decision making. The first one is to ask the question whether it's acute or chronic. The second one, whether it's a stable or unstable. The third point is the degree of sleep or the amount of sleep. The fourth is age of the child. And the fifth is the predisposing conditions. So these are the five points which helps us to decide what should be the line of treatment. So just to give you some information, and then we are going to discuss the importance of this. The acute or chronic, any slip which is less than three weeks is called acute. When the duration of the symptoms are more than three weeks, it's called chronic. There is an in-between variety where symptoms are more than three weeks, but all of a sudden there is acute exacerbation of the symptoms and that is called acute or chronic. So these are the three points. Now I would like to ask Hitesh, Dr. Hitesh Shah, that uh, how do you differentiate between the acute fracture and the acute slip? This is a problem which many times we see in the practice and it becomes very difficult for us uh, whether it's acute slip or acute fracture. Yeah, Hitesh. Yeah, thank you, Duren Bhai. Good morning, good evening, everybody. That's a very valid question for the management. Uh, in short, the, we need to ask the history the neck femur fracture in children always happen with the high velocity injury, where the acute sleep happened with the low velocity or uh, trivial. Sorry, can you mute? Yeah, I, I muted him. Yeah, please go ahead. Hitesh. Yeah. So then uh, the second part is that the one of the another differential question, what you mentioned very nicely is acute, acute on chronic and chronic. Where the chronic and acute and chronic, we will see very important radiological marker is its remodeling. That will be metaphysical bump or metaphysical remodeling would be present. 
and some of the acute cases in slip also the end would be a little bit blunt where in case of the fracture it would be very sharp end these are the two important differential point between the differential between fracture and uh, slip okay thank you it so that's very important that the first is the clinical or the history and the second is radiological feature good also uh, the age group you will not see uh, slips in young children and sometimes you get the traumatic slips in a very young children even two or three year olds yeah so. yeah that's another important point yes particularly younger kids they are more likely to have fracture rather than the slip capital tumoral epiphysis yes coming to the second point which is important for decision making is whether it's a stable or unstable in simple word if child can bear a weight on the affected extremity then it is called stable even if he is able to walk with crutches elbow crutch or the uh, axillary crutch it's considered stable and if child is not able to bear weight on the affected extremity it is called unstable now i would like to ask uh, dr thomas how do you consider this factor into decision making so how do you give uh, what, what importance you give to this factor i think that's a uh, very important to differentiate to distinguish between acute and i mean unstable slip and a stable slip because the prognosis is very different uh, an unstable slip carries a very high grave prognosis of avn and uh, whereas the stable slip uh, it's not so so uh, uh, prognostically bad that is one and uh, and as you said unstable is when the when the child has so much pain that he she he or she can't even stand upright uh and less than 5 to 10% of all skiffy is unstable so it's very important to make the distinction of unstable because decision making and treatment uh, is so important in unstable skiffy so one is like uh, you rightly said that the prognosis is very different but what about the management yeah so the management of unstable you have to do it urgently uh, meaning within a uh, few days to uh, of preferably 24 to 48 hours if you can do it whereas a stable slip we can delay the management okay good so these are the two important point hitesh would you like to add some yeah please yeah i agree with the thomas what he said is the prognosis is different second is the timing of management is different the third important aspect is that the unstable slip i like to fix with the two screws rather than one screw which uh, if i going to put with in situ then uh, i will do about the couple of screw then the single screw another differential point and is a controversial point like a tamponade effect where the thomas mentioned the avn is very high uh, i try to decompress the joint if we put about the one screw and the fourth point is there delayed weight bearing i i generally do if it is unstable slip i put it on the weight bearing would be really very delayed because there are high chances of the avn and i'll check the clinically whether child can have a range of motion which is painless then only i start it if it is a painful then i don't think i will do some investigation to find out the avn so delayed weight bearing is also one of the differential point between stable and unstable okay so, so if we summarize say, sorry, yeah thomas please sorry de delayed uh, weight bearing what exactly do you mean and do you keep them in bed for some time or do you walk three, them three months always three, keep but three months non weight bearing for the unstable but by non weight bearing are you mobilizing them or are you keeping them on bed rest no no we mobilize with the crutches crutches yes. but not weight bearing so in in terms of not partial or full weight bearing it will be non weight bearing with bilateral flexibility crutches total i think that very is okay. very a lot of lot of people allow to touch weight bearing yeah Uh, i think that is a, that is a point of debate uh, whether you allow weight bearing partial or this thing but uh, i think the main factors are that they are very prognostically different yeah. and you have to treat emergently in case of an unstable skiffy sure. whereas a stable skiffy you can treat it a little bit more electively yeah okay so that's a uh, very good uh, that we need to differentiate and then uh, definitely it has a practical implication in uh management coming to the third point and that is degree of sleep and it's measured by sleep angle 
last time we discussed that how to look at the sleep angle the first line is drawn from the edges of epiphysis then we draw a perpendicular 90 degree angle line to that and then we draw this is the first line and then we draw a second line which is long axis of the shaft and the angle between these two line is called the sleep angle the classification is uh, like the severity of the sleep is if it is less than 30 degree it's called mild 30 to 50 degree less than 50 degree is called moderate and more than 50 degree is called severe so this is easy and like on the frog leg view we can measure it now again i would like to ask uh, um dr john about like how do you consider this uh, degree of sleep into the decision making yes so if it is a very mild slip most likely it would be a fixation in situ what we do of course do is to what we call sometimes incidental reduction is to gently put it with a mild internal rotation on the table and sometimes that will give you some amount of reduction uh, when you come to the higher grade slips then if you treat them with spinning uh, in situ then you have the problems of uh, some kind of uh, fai impingement leading on to osteoarthritis so there today we would do what is uh, considered the uh, way to treat this is to do a safe surgical di dislocation do an open reduction of the physis and then uh, fix it with screws using a uh, so you do a trochanteric flip osteotomy and uh, do the reduction and fixation through that so we are very clear that for the mild in situ pinning for the severe uh, the modified done is the current preferred method uh, hitesh what would you think about moderate one yeah the, the moderate one is a very controversial where the it depends on the uh, the age of patient growth remaining underlying pathology the bone quality and say that it can be merged with either the mild or it can be merged with the severe so the most of the people will consider who are very comfortable with the severe sleep they will treat as moderate and severe and some of the conservative society will take it like a for the in situ pinning for all like a old classical description like a loader they will put also moderate as with the mild they do the fixation and tackle the residual problem of fai and other that will later so there is no clear cut answer for the moderate but uh, it can be the moderate and severe can be clubbed together or mild and moderate to be clubbed together okay thomas what is what are your views about like where do you put moderate into the milder one or you take it into the severe one i am a little more conservative so sometimes even for severe slips also i do in situ pinning and allow remodeling because uh, i think this fai has been has been overblown after the after the turn of the century again the wheel is slowly going back to in situ being the main stay of treatment and allowing remodeling and then going in to do an osteochondroplasty so i think for the severe i think it's still debatable mild and moderate i always in situ fix which is i think is the mainstay and most safe method of treating skiffy okay so, yeah, so basically yeah yeah so john please so that's one of the issues that comes with more and more people doing it when you saw the results in the hands of the people who advocated it initially they had 0% apn and yeah. excellent results and so that becomes exactly uh, the thing everyone's striving for but i think as more and more people are doing it you're getting more and more complications and more and more avians being reported so Correct. it's uh, we're still in that space where we are not 100% sure but by and large the ones which are really a severe deformity we would tend to try and uh, still fix while the ones which are mild we would tend to pin in situ while the really uh, uh, severe slips we would tend to do an open reduction but yes there is this uh, changing scenario at the moment we don't know which way the pendulum will swing with time yeah so i would like to emphasize mainly to the postgraduates that this is this point is a controversial point 
And at this stage, we don't have a clarity, exact clarity or the clear cut answer about the uh, baseline of treatment. Probably as John said, for mild, yes, in situ pinning is a preferred one. For the severe one, uh, the preferred option is the modified done procedure. But as uh, Dr. Thomas said that, yes, again, once you start looking at your own complication, you start thinking to go or to be more conservative. <coughs> Sorry, because in situ pinning, uh, pinning has relatively less complication, particularly avascular necrosis compared to the modified done. So that we will discuss later on. But this is one point which is um, at present, we don't have a black and white answer to that. It's a gray zone. Coming to the fourth point is age. Uh, at what age the child presents to us? The first question, very basic question, but still it's very important for us to understand. How do you evaluate the sexual development of the child? So Hitesh, can you throw some light uh, or some idea? How, what do you, which, which points you look for the sexual development? Or you just look at the age as a chronological number? No, uh, actually, uh, the age, uh, the most of the SCFE patient would be seen as a delayed maturation, and maturation is getting delayed. And if you see the, uh, if they are near maturity, there is unlikely to sleep is going to progress. That is the reason the age is also very important criteria. The clinically, it's very important to see the tenor grading for the boys and girls. Whether it is that what grade are there, they are grade 10 or 0 or 1, there are a lot of growth remaining and then they are going to progress a lot. So that is a clinical age. And second is that in a radiological age, it's a, at this era, it will be very important to know about Oxford and modified Oxford scoring. If the Oxford scoring is less than 16 or that delayed maturation would be there, that will be useful for the pinning on the affected, non-affected side. So that is called as the contralateral pinning. And that has been very, very useful for the age. Age is a very important. In, in reality, when we were not using about any of this one for the better understanding, it will be, age would be described as juvenile slip and adolescent slip. If it is juvenile slip, always, always, always do about the opposite side or contralateral pinning. Okay. Thomas, what are your views on this? Well, as Hitesh rightly said, uh, I think for younger age group, uh, less than 11 in girls and less than 13 in boys, and if they, had, they have associated endocrinopathy, we also look at the bone age sometimes a mox, or modified Oxford like uh, Hitesh said. And if it's less than 20, then we go in for a prophylactic pinning of the other side. Okay, good. And like, can you, uh, or like, how do you evaluate sexual development? No, we go by chronology. We don't really go by Tanner's grading, but uh, I think uh, the chronological age, and if, if we go by the skeletal, we don't really do the hair distribution and the Tanner grading that much, but uh, I think that's there in theory book that you, where if you want to evaluate the maturation, you have to do a Tanner staging, yeah. Okay, so you try to keep the thing simple yeah. and you really don't want to like go into the detailed thing. Not and right. Dr. John, what is your philosophy? Do you just go according to the chronological age or you go for the tenor classification and all that? Okay, fine. Probably he has lost the connection. Okay, coming to the fifth point and that is a predisposing factor because we know that a lot of sleep is a predisposing factor and uh, when patient comes to us, we really need to go for some investigations. So I would like to ask uh, Dr. Thomas, like which investigation, can you give us a list of investigations which you suggest to a child who is coming to uh, you with a slip capital femoral epiphysis? Well, apart from the x-rays and even in the x-rays, if it's an unstable skiffy, do not take a, a frog lateral, but take a cross leg lateral. So you don't move the affected limb. Apart from an AP and a lateral, also evaluate the uh, endocrine status. Uh, we do a, uh, apart from blood tests, we do a thyroid hormone, gonadal hormones. Uh, and also, if it's an unstable skiffy, at, in our institution, standard of care is to do a SPECT scan or pre treatment scan to determine whether vascularity is present or not before we go ahead and 
spin or do any treatment to know whether avascular necrosis is already set in prior to our treatment or not. But is MRI or the bone scan are not a reliable tool for? It's uh, not reached. They say it's not really become very uh, 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 good at finding out. But uh, that's the tool we have for the last five, six years. We've been using SPECT scan. We've got a good nuclear medicine department. MRI uh, perfusion imaging is in, in its infancy. I'm sure in the future it will it'll become better and better. More radiologists will... Uh, get get to say whether it's vascular or vascular. I think it's just a matter of time before that becomes a good modality. Okay, so, is there an indication for a CT in these, or you don't do CTs at all? I don't do CTs. Okay. Um, just uh, one query that you say the thyroid. That's okay. We go for the TSH and the three T T four. Vitamin D also. Vitamin D also, because yeah. I, I was just going to ask that question because yeah. uh, Professor because, Madhuri once uh, yeah, mentioned we were the first among the first among the uh, to show that vitamin D also has a predisposition to slip. I think we yeah. published that in JBJS. Yeah. Yeah. And the, for the boys, you go for the testosterone level, but for the girls, uh, you Eastern, measure which yeah, Sometimes, but you don't really do sex hormones unless we, we really think there is a problem, but definitely thyroid, parathyroid. And sometimes pituitary, we're thinking of pituitary, some pituitary. Yeah. We do a pituitary level, yeah. Very rarely sex hormones. Yeah. Hitesh, what are your battery of investigations? Yeah, I agree with the Thomas. That's the uh, AP frog lateral, unstable, cross stable lateral. I don't go for MRI or SPAC scan, but I do the hormonal investigation in form of the T3, T4, TSH, PTH. Then do about the renal function test. Many of them will be having the altered renal uh, problem. So that's a secondary to renal problem also. And uh, do about vitamin D for every single case. And depends on the, the endocrine status. Can do, not all the cases, not all the patients, but can do about the testosterone, growth hormone, FSH and LH in some of the selective cases. Okay. Right. Uh, Dr. John, would you like to add something to this or we go no, to the I next think, point? I think everything's been covered. So uh, basically, uh, sort of work up by the endocrinologist if, if we suspect anything. Uh, okay. And so. just like the quick question, Hitesh, have you uh, any time because of this abnormality in the endocrinal taste? had to cancel the surgery. Have you come across any such situation? We have the situation like that is a hyperparathyroidism. That is because of the primary tumor of the parathyroid gland. And because of the various reasons about the anesthetic, they said we need to give priority to the parathyroid excision. But I will share one other example. Waiting for the parathyroid or the doing about the surgery by the general surgeon or the specialist surgeon or endocrine surgeon, uh, if you wait that the mild slip will become the severe slip. So, and my take home message is that do not delay in those cases. Even though when they are doing single C2, uh, in C2 pinning would be very, very simple and smaller surgery rather than doing about the fancy and big surgery for severe slip. Okay, so uh, in in practical sense, like you have not come across a situation where the surgery has to be uh, postponed. It is the only yeah. reason is because this surgery can be done under spinal anesthesia, and even with uh, severe hypothyroidism, spinal is, anesthesia is relatively safe one. No, the, even hypo, hypothyroidism when TSH is very high, the anesthetics are not going to give the anesthesia. They come. Up That's a much. general anesthesia, but uh, what about the spinal anesthesia? If the child is very young, they don't give a spinal anesthesia. Yeah, very very young child with the hypothyroidism. They'll always take uh, only if the child is fit for general as well. Yeah. In case. Yeah, in case the spinal does spinal. not, they always need yeah, but, uh, like only recently I come across a situation where it was a severe hypothyroidism where TSH was uh, around 100 yeah. and the anesthetist was reluctant to give anesthesia as Dr. Thomas said. So what do you do in such situation? Because thyroid is not going to come under control in a day. It will take few days at least to stabilize. So how should we proceed in such case? 
I think the endocrinologists have to take a call. The endocrinologists and the anesthetists have to get together. We'll tell them the emergency of the procedure and they'll take, say, okay, the risks are worth taking. Then they will tell us to go ahead. But I think the call is between the endocrinologists and the anesthetists. Okay, good. So that's one point uh, which is important for the practical point of view. Now we discuss about uh, the in situ pinning and the point which we discussed last time in the animation, which I would like to emphasize again, why in situ pinning? In situ pinning means we are not trying to reduce the slip. Whatever position is there, we try to fix it in that position. And that's why it's called in situ, in the same position we are fixing. The reason is like, let's take this example where there is a mild slip. And because of that, the posterior retinacular vessels has become short because of the chronicity of the nature of the condition. Now, when we try to reduce that sleep, these retinacular vessels are stretched and then torn. And that may lead to avascular necrosis. So with that idea, we don't try to reduce it and we just try to fix it in C2. So the message is like forceful attempt may lead to avascular necrosis. On the other end, many times we just tie the limb, affected limb on the fracture table and without doing any forceful maneuver, uh, sometimes the part of the sleep or the part of the degree of sleep, it reduces to some extent. That is okay, but don't try to internally rotate or apply traction to reduce the sleep. Now, a quick question, which implant do you prefer? When I say this question, uh, I want to know uh, 6.5 millimeter screw, fully threaded or 32 mm threading, and titanium or a steel, cannulated or non-cannulated. All these four points. Yeah, Thomas, what are your uh, preferred so, implants? I use a single uh, stainless steel, fully threaded cannulated screw for ease of removal with a washer. Uh, I don't use a titanium because it gets it's very difficult to remove, and uh, and a fully threaded because you want bone to grow across the physis so that it doesn't slip. So I use a fully threaded 6.5 cannulated screw with a washer. Okay, one screw. Yeah, one screw. Yeah, Hitesh, your preference? I use 6.5 fully threaded stainless steel screw, but I don't use washer. Cannulated or non-cannulated? Cannulated. Cannulated. Okay, and John, what about you? So we've been using the titanium screws because that's what we've got with us. Uh, so it's a fully uh, six point five. Uh, so it, so if there is a slip where we can get the all the threads across, then we, but usually it's it, we don't get the fully threaded screws. We get the slightly longer threaded screws, so which are not uh, which are not compressing the physis, but we we tend to use that. We, uh, we don't have the fully threaded screws in uh, available to us in the 6.5. So we use the slightly longer threaded screws. So it's not fully threaded, but it's not compressing it either. Yeah, so uh, in, in Ahmedabad, the situation is like, if you want to use titanium, uh, the cannulated screws are available only with 32 millimeter yeah, threading. that's right, yeah. But if you go for stainless steel, yes, fully threaded screws are available. So as uh, Dr. Thomas and Dr. Hitesh say, if, if uh, you go for a fully threaded, then the steel, uh, stainless steel should be the preferred material. And it's usually one, was... but for the unstable two, yeah. Yeah, unstable too, right. Okay, now coming to the very important point and that's the direction of screw. Last time we had a question and uh, Dr. Janki asked that question. So I have prepared uh, this animation to understand the direction of screw. So let's say a situation uh, where there is no uh, sleep and something like uh, we have a fracture. And if we want to fix it, then usually we go perpendicular to the physis, epiphysis. Now, in the mild sleep, the, sleep, the epiphysis has gone posteriorly. And so to remain perpendicular, we have to go slightly anterior. And in the more moderate sleep, to remain perpendicular to the epiphysis, we may have to go further anterior. Now I will show you all the three animations together. And that will give us an idea that uh, as the sleep uh, slips posteriorly, the entry point or the starting point should be more and more anterior. So that is about the 
clarity like why we really need to go anterior and please don't comment when you look at the x ray of someone with a moderate or a severe slip and fixation that probably has not passed the screw properly from the lateral side so if you see okay. the screw head at the uh, anterior aspect of the neck it is purposefully he or she has done that now the another important question a uh, patient they ask us about the implant removal so uh, thomas what is your philosophy of implant removal no i don't remove uh, the screw unless it's really causing a bother or causing irritation or something once the slip is stabilized but i rarely remove the screw okay so you don't remove the screw no. and like uh, and if you have to remove you remove it after the growth is over or remove, sometimes remove, you I remove leave it, it to the total hip people to remove it much later i think i okay. never remove the single screw right what about you hitesh i don't remove generally unless there is a complication like a penetration or evn or collapse if it is happens like that then we have to remove other than that i don't remove and even though i, I will uh, assure and explain counsel the parents and patient don't remove this implant unless growth is over because i have seen enough the one of the surgeon has attempted implant removal and after that the slip happened oh so that it is a very disastrous condition okay so that's a very important thing that don't remove it uh, unless and until the growth is over yeah and uh, in in the same uh, direction uh, dr john i would like to ask you that you go for a 32 mm threading screw for the titanium metal and do you face any difficulty while removing the screw so i don't routinely remove the screws either but uh, we do have patients who want it removed i think that is one of the things that they literally uh are after you know you are but i would not remove it till fusion and then i warn them that it may not come out and so i'll do it only in the understanding that we'll take it out if it comes out easily nowadays you have these screws which are reverse cutting so they are a little easier to remove than the earlier ones but uh, i still warn them that if it is not possible we would leave them and that there's no major problem in leaving the screws long term yeah so that's another important thing that uh, partly a uh, threaded screw may be uh, difficult to remove and sometimes the head portion may break out and we may not be able to remove the screw so that's one important point i think the ideal given if i may add the ideal implant if you ask me is what the scandinavians use the hansen pin yeah it doesn't have a threaded portion across the pieces which allows the neck to grow and remodel but we don't have that in india so but i think that is the ideal implant to use okay yes we are coming to that point only so that was a point which is you rightly um, brought out like will in situ pinning lead to coxa vara because we are fixing or the screw threads are across the physis and will hamper the growth of uh, neck so will it lead to coxa preva thomas what do you think Yeah, I think in particularly when you follow up premature facial arrest and shortening of the neck, where I'm not sure. No, I'm talking about the coxa breva, the shortening breva of the neck. Yeah, neck becomes shorter, ATD becomes smaller. Yes. But uh, where I, I'm not sure about coxa vera. Okay, right. Hitesh, what is your understanding about this? Yeah, there is whenever we uh, attempt for the fusion between the epiphysis and metaphysis. if it is getting fused it is always chances of the coxa breva but it would not be very clinically relevant because uh, most of the time trochanter phys is also getting over around 12 years and that is the reason we don't know about trochanter epiphysiotasis but this problem will be really very prominent if the child is very young if it is a lot of growth remaining in the trochanter then yes we will see a lot of patient with the coxa breva okay uh, just to continue uh, the discussion in this direction recently at the last uh, posicon uh, dr venkat from ganga hospital presented a paper and i asked him like what was the conclusion of his paper and he said that even the screw threads are crossing the physis not in all but many of the patients have a growth across the physis so it's not like the uh what we expect the growth modulation screw that the neck or the does not grow it grows but compared to the opposite side 
the length of the neck will be smaller. The point which he said that on the other end, the trochanter, the greater trochanter will continue to grow because there is no restriction over there. So neck will grow at a slower speed or relatively less, but the trochanter will grow uh, at a normal speed. And that leads to, over a period of time, the reduction in the articular trochanteric distance. That is what his paper concluded. And I brought it and I, I made an animation for that to understand that uh, this is what happened over a period of time. This problem is very important, particularly for uh, younger children, those who are around 10 or 12 years, because growth is more remaining and that they may come across this problem. Now, uh, in such situation, do you go for a bilateral or the contralateral pinning because then asymmetrical distance, uh, articular trochanteric distance point can be avoided. Thomas, what do you do in this younger kids? Yeah, so definitely age is a big factor. As, as I said, less than 11 in boys and less than 13, or 11 in girls and less than 13 in boys, along with endocrine factors I take into account. And Definitely, I think in our country, uh, prophylactic pinning on the other side is economically more feasible and better because uh, they are, they, they, there are papers to prove that within the next uh, 12 to 18 months, the opposite side invariably slips in, uh, I think, 25 to 30% of cases. So I think it makes sense to prophylactically pin and reduce the burden. Uh, so I'm 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 all in favor of, of prophylactic pending if uh, of the other side if if indications are right. Okay, coming to the next point about the contralateral pinning. Now already you discussed about the age. Uh, the practical point is many times parents are reluctant to get operated on the opposite side, which is not having any problem. And when we say the statistics is 50-50 chances, they say that uh, we would like to observe. So, Dr. John, what are your tricks? How do you convince the patient? No doubt, so I, in I your think, case, your seniority is definitely going to make no, a lot of difference. No, no, we still have a lot of patients who will refuse to have the second surgery, other side surgery done. I think uh, with in the younger children, I would emphasize it a bit more. The older ch the child, the less uh, sort of uh, uh, dogmatic I am about trying to do the other side. So I think the older children, you have a reasonable chance that they may not slip as long as they don't have any other endocrinopathy with it. So the ones with endocrinopathy or the very young children, I would definitely try and convince them that they should have the other side done. Okay. And if we decide like the patient uh, family wants not to be get operated for the control little side. We need to observe them very closely. So Very closely. That's a very important point that we need to emphasize that slightest amount of pain or a limp uh, come to us and like we need to take x-rays or uh, required investigations. That's a very important point. Coming to uh, another spectrum and that's a severe sleep. So the first point which we need to understand that why not in situ pinning for severe sleep. This is very important. And uh, Dr. John already emphasized or told us about that, that let's see this uh, severe sleep and you're fixed with in situ pinning. Now, the problem is that metaphyseal bump, which is shown with a red arrow, this may abut against the anterior rim of the acetabulum and may tear the Lebrum, and that may become the initiating point and may lead to osteoarthrosis. So, as shown in this animation, that even with fixation, the severe sleep, the metaphyseal bump will cause osteoarthrosis over a period of time. So, a lot of people they don't prefer now in situ pinning for severe sleep. So, we have a two options for severe sleep. The first option is that uh, we carry out in situ fixation. But the problem is metaphyseal bump. And then either arthroscopically or with a, a mini open incision, we open the anterior aspect of the femoral neck or the metaphyseal area and chop out this bump. So that is option one. So like this. And for the amount of deformity, we carry out a compensatory deformity in the trochanteric or the subtrochanteric area. 
So as we can see that the metaphysis has abducted and uh, to compensate, we are carrying out a valgus osteotomy in the distal portion. So this is option one. The option two, as Dr. John described earlier, the safe surgical dislocation and the reduction of the sleep. To understand that this is a severe sleep, we pass a temporary fixation because when we are reducing surgically, uh, sorry, when we are uh, dislocating the hip joint surgically, uh, there may be a displacement at the sleep side. So we fix it temporarily. Then we surgically dislocate the uh, proximal femur, hip joint, take out this point. And now we need to remember that the posterior retinacular vessel has become short. So if we just try to reduce it, it will lead to avascular necrosis. So instead of that, we create a cleavage plane between the metaphysis and the epiphysis and then shorten the part of the neck like this. And then we reduce. So now there is no tension, no stretching of the retinacular vessels and that will not lead to avascular necrosis. And then we carry out with one or two screws and then we reduce this. This is called a modified done procedure. And here we are reducing the sleep and we are getting trying to get anatomical alignment. To show you the case, a severe sleep, AP view, the lateral view, and this is after the safe surgical dislocation and the reduction of the sleep and fixation with the two screws. The two screws across the greater trochanter are basically to fix the osteotomy, which we have done for the safe surgical dislocation. This is a lateral view. It really looks well on the x-rays, but the point which I would like to say is that this procedure is a steep learning curve. So don't just read it yeah. from the book or look at the video available on the YouTube and start doing it. That's really, really a dangerous thing. I would just like now to ask our faculty, how do they approach severe sleep? Dr. Thomas. We go with your option one most of the time. Uh, that is to fix in situ and then do an open arthroscope, uh, no, open osteochondroplasty. Uh, we were very aggressive from 2009 or 2010. We were, we were among the first to actually write about surgical realignment, publish about this because the people from Slongo and everybody came down to Vellore well and showed us the technique. We actually gone through a big learning curve. And I have over the last few years, I've seen the co consequences. I think at least we have in our series at least 25% of we win over a long term follow up. So I've been a little more conservative and I, 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 I do more of in situ pinning and open osteochondroplasty now rather than a surgical realignment uh, dance osteotomy modified dance for acute unstable slips. Yeah. Dr. John, what is your preference? So I think for the severe slips, we are still doing an open reduction, the modified done procedure. Uh, our results, so we've had one case which had a major problem, uh, but otherwise we've had fairly good results with them. Uh, so we are still happy with them. I don't think we do the numbers that they do in CMC below. So maybe we, if we do some more, we might have some more complications, which, uh, but I think we've done about 12 for them so far. and. We've had one major complication. And no, otherwise they have been, uh, and this was a bilateral case which had problems on both sides. So unfortunately it's one of those patients who, uh, and it was an unstable slip when he came. So that was the other problem with it. So uh, other than that, our results have been fairly satisfactory. Uh, of course, we do them with a lot of uh, planning, preparation, take our time over doing it. Uh, the second thing is um, the trochantric flip, the direction of the screws fixing it tend to be more towards the calca rather than the neck as you showed in that case. So we usually just use two 3.5 screws which go towards the calca. And because it's a flip and not a full osteotomy, uh, not the traditional osteotomy, 
things tend to fall back in place and it's not been such a problem. The problem sometimes comes in making sure your screws that go into the hip are not getting in the way of your osteotomy fixation. Yeah, Hitesh, what are your views on this? Yeah, I will say that I have done the both and now I have learned in a way that there is a higher chances of the AVN, but there are the problems with the both. Uh, issue with the modified done is a higher frequency of AVN and we cannot predict which will go for AVN. And the problem with the subtrochanteric osteotomy, we may not get the, because it will be like a zigzag, but it will be more safe. So I tend to explain to the parents and patient both and say the both and they have to select because I have done a reasonable number on both sides. So I generally do the both actually in my practice. Okay. So how do you, you, so which do you try to convince them for? <laughs> <Yeah. that's, laughs> leave it to them. <laughs> or like what, what is your incidence? You tell them about the modified duns. What if I then I will say I, I don't hesitate that one fifth will uh, fifteen to twenty percent it will go for AV and then once it will go for AV and there is no salvage actually other than THR. Right. What is that? That is absolutely I am very very blunt on say that once it has happened the AV and we don't have anything. If we have something range of motion restriction with option one, we can still do the osteochondroplasty. But in uh, if AV and happens. Yeah, I can understand in uh, unstable avian happens, but if by chance, if it is stable and it go for avian, it's most of the cases uh, iatrogenic. Okay, good. So the point is like uh, 15 to 25% complication rate with this procedure. And these are the people who are having a large volume of uh, this modified done. So the point I would like to convey to the postgraduate that please be careful doing this surgery and if you want to do it, have a proper training or someone who is experienced person with this procedure with you while you are doing it in your practice. Okay, coming to the last part of the uh, discussion, and that's about the complications. There are a few complications. The first is avascular necrosis. Second is chondrolysis. Very rarely we see sleep progression. And uh, I think Hites mentioned about that the premature removal of the screw may lead to that problem or occasionally the breakage of implant. We will discuss the first and the two uh, common complications that's avascular necrosis and the chondrolysis. So this is a boy, uh, this is a preoperative x-ray and this is after fixation. And as there are two screws that suggest that this is unstable uh, situation, but the post-operative X-ray shows avascular necrosis. One thing which we need to remember about avascular necrosis is that it's only seen in operated cases. So it's an iatrogenic complication. Usually this complication is seen like other avascular necrosis within two years of the uh, sleep. Usually we don't need sophisticated investigations because increase in pain and stiffness after initial improvement of the pain following surgery is the classical presentation. However, if we want to go MRI, maybe uh, giving us a good information. The bisphosphonate is considered by some as a prophylactic treatment or as a therapeutic options, as a, a known operative treatment. There are a lot of other options like shockwave uh, therapy, the pulse electromagnetic uh, therapy, or hyperbaric oxygen is also suggested for this. When it comes to surgical treatment, the core decompression, rotational osteotomy like Sujiako, or the hip distraction, the trapdoor procedure in which we open the area, curettage, and fill it with a bone graft, pelvic support osteotomy, or THR are the options, or sometimes very occasionally arthrodesis. So now the question is, um, Hitesh, how do you select a treatment for avascular necrosis? Yeah, it's a very difficult question. And uh, <laughs> I can say that if there is an AVN, we need to find out what is the age of the child, what is the status of physis, what is the amount of AVN, whether it is collapse or not, whether it is a segmental or total end involvement, depends on that, what you have mentioned on the options. But we can choose the option Depends on the all the factors. If there is a only a 
uh, only focal collapse is there or focal avian is there, then we can do about the bisphosphonate and that works very well. You can remove the screw and the same track, we can inject all the avian part, you can inject about the uh, bisphosphonate and keep it for non on weight bearing. And I have seen some of the companies, some of the patients do very well. Well, if it is uh, total involvement, then it is the avian with the bisphosphonate, it would not be very useful. Then the salvage option like total hip or pelvic support osteotomy would be. Okay, just a quick question. Uh, if you inject bisphosphonate in the track of the screw, what measures you take uh, so that it remains yeah, in, uh, in, in position o yeah, over there? Yeah. Generally, in, in case of the uh, what uh, we do that, when we remove in a couple of screw, then we uh, remove the screw where there is alien is high. Other part we don't remove and we press it with the, in a 10 to 15 minutes with the syringe, we hold it. We don't uh, press too much, very slowly inject and keep it in the same position. So it will not back out. Otherwise, with the other track, it will come out. Yeah, but it's a big track of a screw and your syringe is very small. So how do you Keep it press. So when it is there, we go in the same track and at the avian side, in apophysis will change the track. Apophysis will change the track on the, so it will be very small, the thin wire. Right. Or some point to guide wire only. Okay, uh, Thomas, what are your views about avascular necrosis management? Oh, like uh, Hitesh said, avian is a very difficult, devastating complication. Not, actually, there's nothing much you can do. All these, all these uh, measures that you say are, uh, they are not very uh, satisfactory or uh, equivocal. In fact, bisphosphonates themselves are very controversial. Whether it helps or don't doesn't help, it's up in, up in the air for debate. Uh, so we try bisphosphonates. If it's partial avian, I think like with Tesh said, the outlook is much better. The patient is younger. But if the patient is older, teenage, and total avian, I think uh, he's more or less going to end up with having a total hip. And uh, Dr. John, what are your views? Because you are... So, um... Yeah, so we do, uh, in some of these, we have done like a valgus osteotomy to get a better part of the head under the stablum. And uh, in children, some of them do well. I mean, they'll do well for 8, 10, 12 years. Eventually, they will end up with uh, problems and then you have to do something more. Uh, the other thing, in really bad one, we have done, one patient, we've done actually a like head excision and a pelvic support osteotomy. So those are the two uh, really bad ones that we've dealt with, uh, where we've actually done something uh, surgical for the AVN. Otherwise, it's been, we do use bisphosphonates. Uh, injectable, I've only done once before. I'm still not sure about how it works, but uh, we do certainly do oral use oral bisphosphonates for a period of two years or so. Uh, and... Uh, they, certain, they get symptomatic relief, whether it eventually delays their THR or not, we don't know yet. Yeah. So, yes, avascular ne uh, necrosis is a dreaded complication and still we don't have a good treatment to control uh, the avascular necrosis and or uh, modify the prognosis of avascular necrosis. Coming to the last point, and that's about the controlysis. Chondrolysis is basically an acute cartilage necrosis. Previously, it was believed, I'm sure 20 years before, it was believed that uh, during surgery, if your pin, guide wire, or screw has penetrated the uh, femoral head, that tip of the screw will go on eroding the acetabular cartilage and will cause chondrolysis. However, later on, uh, we also saw that in untreated cases also we see this complication. So this uh, penetration theory cannot be applicable over there. And later on we realized that probably it's an inflammatory condition as we see in idiopathic chondrolysis. So that could be the reason. So this is a case uh, preoperative and this is after fixation. We can see that uh, the cartilage is lost and these are the close-up views. Again, coming to the treatment options for that, we have traction, we can go for range of motion exercise or soft tissue release to increase the range of motion or some sort of osteotomy or hip arthrodesis. So these are the options available to us. Now, uh, we will have only two questions uh, for the discuss. And the first is, uh, Hitesh, how does this condition differ, the slip capital 
uh, femoral epiphysis chondrolysis differs from idiopathic variety? Uh, it only differs on one point. In case of the uh, idiopathic chondrolysis, which will have the abduction deformity, while it, because this is a coxavara and the non-treated case will have adduction deformity. So for the, the postgraduate, I will say one dictum, in case of the case which is having flexion deformity or adduction deformity with a slip, always think some complication like chondrolysis. So it's very important. In case of the typical slip in a clinical scenario, you will not get any fixed flexion deformity. While in case of the uh, chondrolysis, if any deformity is happening in hip, either it will be complicated, AVN or the chondrolysis. So that is a one point, adduction and abduction deformity. Management wise, I don't think so any much different because I will put about attraction and do the range of motion exercise. Okay. Uh, Thomas, what about you? Like, how do you manage so, chondrolysis? Uh, so we, we've not seen uh, with two minutes of chondrolysis in, uh, in slipped, but I think it actually sometimes uh, coexists with AVN. If you've seen a few, uh, but uh, from idiopathic chondrolysis, both the chondrolysis, uh, one is the, uh, like you said, screw penetration, but with improvements in imaging and uh, all we've come, we reduce that incidence. But treatment wise, it's uh, uh, both, we treat both the chondrolysis almost the same by traction physiotherapy is one way. The other way is sometimes we are a little more aggressive. We do sometimes we do an MRI map the chondrolysis, the cartilage uh, uh, defect, and do a surgical dislocation. And do like uh, the knee, we do a, a method of drilling and uh, getting fibrocartilage and then putting them on CPM. So we both use both methods. We are in a, we're actually looking at our results at, at the moment, actually. Okay. Uh, Dr. John, would you like to add yeah, on so, to this? So we haven't seen uh, it in uh, slip capital epiphysis, but we do see idiopathic chondrolysis, which is, uh, for me, a real nightmare to treat because they come at a time when these uh, usually young girls, uh, 14, 15, they have a severe abduction deformity and a totally stiff hip. That's the state, state I get them in. And managing them has been, I've tried everything which was mentioned. I even sent one or two to CMC fellow to Risha because at one stage she was doing this uh, safe surgical dislocation and stem cell therapy. But uh, that patient came back. They didn't do anything because they did physio and they said she was better. But when she came back, she again developed the same deformity. And so I've ended up doing uh, surgery in two of them. One was a actually ended up with a, a, a girdle stone and a, a pelvic support osteotomy. And one of them, I actually did an adduction deformity, adduction osteotomy, yeah, because she had a fused hip in abduction and I did an adduction osteotomy. But the sad part of it, she was much better in terms of walking, but she was able to squat before the abduction osteotomy with, I don't know how, Although she had no movement in the hip, she was able. It's like an arthrodesis sometimes. But after we did this osteotomy, she was not able to squat. So that was a sad uh, thing that she was much better in terms of her pelvic obliquity and things like that. But she wasn't able to squat, which was she, which she was able to do before. So I'm not sure whether we did her any good or not. Okay, so that was a good discussion about that. Uh, Dr. Janki, if there are any questions or any point, any anything would you like to add to this? Yeah, I think we are pretty close on time. Yeah. <laughs> so. Thank you very much, sir. It was great discussion. Just one thing, sir. Uh, as you told that about that the metaphysical bump, so why not we remove only the bump part, sir, uh, when it is severe why it is that, that okay the question that. is like uh, there is a deformity so we are leaving the deformity and we are removing the bump so that will definitely affect the range of motion so to correct that compensatory correction we are uh, carrying out the uh, deformity at the subtrochanteric level so we are not correcting the deformity at the site where the deformity is and compensatory we are carrying out osteotomy so bump is just to take care of the uh, impingement part. But whatever deformity has taken and place. And further arthritis also. Sir. Arthritis, yeah. But whatever deformity has taken place, we have to compensate at distal level. 
that is why we are combining the both okay sir thank you sir it was great discussion thank you thank you okay so i thank think you. thank you very much to uh, to diren and all the panelists uh, thomas and hitesh i think it was really a very uh, uh, noble of you to spend an hour on this webinar and really help to uh, clear out some of the doubts which all of everyone must be having on dealing with these problems so i think it went off really well and thank you very much and thanks diren as usual for doing a great job and hitesh and thomas for being there and giving their insights on a difficult problem so uh, hopefully uh, we will have further discussions in the future i think hitesh has been here many times on this webinar but for thomas it's the first time so thank you very much again okay thanks nice thank animations you. that in short yeah sure, great yeah. Thanks. thank you thank you okay bye nice to see bye, you everybody. Thanks. bye thank you sir bye. thank you very much thank you